So you keep any questions coming and uh, we'll catch up during the, the break after this. So 30 minutes to coffee. Over to Raga. Morning, folks. Uh, and thanks for attending this. I hope uh, great speakers this morning so far, and I hope I can continue to keep you engaged and give you a different perspective. Um, one of the things um, before I get on this presentation, I wanted just a show of hands. Um, how many companies, individuals here, are either thinking about or embarking on a big data initiative in your company? Just a show of hands. Wow, that's great. So what I'd like to do over the next 25 to 30 minutes is, you know, in the last 60 to 90 days, uh, I've had the opportunity to talk to over you know, 50, 30 to 50 different enterprises, just to get a sense of where they are with open source, what are some of the challenges. And I'd love to kind of do part, uh, and you know, part of the presentation we go through, I'd say 90% is not original content. It's what I hear from customers. I want to share this with you, some of the things they're thinking about. And if you look at the theme of today's presentation, uh, I talked about big data, but it also talked about mobile or mobility and social networking. So the common theme, you know, big data, one would argue, is an intersection of mobility and social networking. To put things in perspective, and I have, uh, this data is a little bit outdated, but November of 2010, Facebook, Three billion photos a month. Think about it. Three billion photos. So if you can think about what impact it has on their infrastructure, how do you really ingest that amount of data? How do you process it? How do you make it highly available? Those are some of the real, real tough questions. And you know, Facebook seems to have conquered it. So if you look at some of the infrastructure, the data centers of Google or of Facebook, on two fronts, right? One is, it's all built on open source, right? So one would argue that the whole business model might not have worked if we're building their entire stack on proprietary applications. Not just from a cost standpoint, but also from an innovation standpoint. So there's a lesson to be learned there. The other thing is, um, you know, over the last, like I said, I've talked to a few customers, I wanted to highlight a few of what big data means. Few examples. The first is, uh, you know, I was talking to you earlier in the week in New York with a large Wall Street firm, which is a large Red Hat customer. So I asked them a very open ended question, you know, which is, how many big data projects do you guys have? The answer was 60. 60 big data projects across different, you know, fixed income, risk, all over the place. And so I asked them, can you give me an example of a big data project that you guys are thinking about or implementing? And this was a very interesting project. What they're trying to do is simulate the price of IBM stock and try to correlate with the economic situation in Greece. Think about it. Two different disparate parts of the world, two different disparate parts, but there's a connection there somewhere. And the way they want to start to emulate and simulate that is through some big data applications. The other example closer to home here in Europe is a large travel services company. And I'm just blown away by the magnitude of the amount of data these guys think about. So six, seven years ago, what this company looks at is what they call click to book ratio, which is as an end user customer, how many clicks do you go through before you book a ticket? Five years ago, or six years ago, I'm sorry, the ratio was four to one. You go to four clicks, you this is the best play, best fare you can go from Amsterdam to London, then you go and get this done. Today, it's 32,000 clicks. Just the sheer variety of data that they have to make some decisions. So see the magnitude of amount of data you have. And at the back end, what these guys need to do is correlate all this stuff. They generate 20 terabytes of log files a day that they run analytics on. So it gives you a sense of, you know, big data isn't just one simple thing. It's just got various business and technical consequences. So what I'd like to do is kind of walk through what I think are some of the storage management imperatives. And by the way, uh, I'm based uh, in Silicon Valley. 
And uh, the building that Red Act is in, in Silicon Valley, on the 11th floor, uh, there's a company, literally a company called 500 Startups, where it is essentially an incubator, where they just bring in startups, and they all share office space. It's a very thriving, amazingly innovative work environment. So when I talk to some of the companies, you know, and this is just a rough sample, over 60% of the companies are either involved in building applications around big data, are trying to help customers make some sense out of the data that's being generated. So what you're seeing is where the industry is going, right? So people are trying to, as the gentleman uh, Harry from IBM pointed out, is how do I get inside of this? So let's kind of go through, you know, a few, uh, you know, I got half a dozen what I would call imperatives around big data, and just to give you a sense of what organizations are thinking about before they start to really embark on real serious projects. So if you were to take a look at just the overall, um, you know, phases of deployment from what I would call pilots to proof of concepts to production, which is how IT really thinks about these things, I would say, you know, if you look at it from a bell curve standpoint, 60 to 70 percent of big data projects are in a pilot phase. So before you actually move into a production or proof of concept phase, you want to make sure your underlying infrastructure is ready to support it, right? So uh, let me just, that's kind of the main theme behind this presentation today. And I talked about this, right? So what we are seeing, uh, if you look at it purely from an enterprise data standpoint, is, for lack of a better term, a seismic shift in the type of data that an enterprise has today. Gone are the days when you just had a bunch of structured data and rows and columns and you run your, you know, whatever uh, business analytics and BI stuff. Now, it's all unstructured data. And this is the number, you know, the graph that I have on the left side is from an IDC report. But what you're seeing is a 5x growth in unstructured data. And they almost, and I have another slide later on, I don't have it here, but with the inversion between structured and unstructured data, is almost 8 to 1 or 9 to 1. So this is the way of the future. You better be ready to manage this. It's not going to stop. The other, uh, oftentimes you get asked this question, is big data just unstructured? The answer is no. It could be some unstructured data. It could be a bunch of different things. So bear that in mind as you think about when we, you know, Red Hat, talk about big data, I'm sure other vendors talk about the same thing. So keep it in the back of your mind as you go through this presentation. So here's the cool thing, you know, at least from an open source vendor standpoint, you know, all, we all share the same mission, which is how we as a community can drive innovation so that IT and business folks are successful with the big data projects. I you know, went to the classic you know, Wikipedia sites and picked how many open source projects out there are directly involved with big data. The answer is over 130. We got over 130 projects. And the names are funny. You, know, you got Pig, you got Zookeeper, you got Mahoot, you got Wonder Dog. You know. One would say they need some folks in marketing who can come up with better terms. But these are the types of projects you know, I take, how many of you are using projects like Zookeeper and Mahout and all these kinds of things today? Because they are very, very powerful projects. But what they're struggling with, I mean, it's great in the lab, but what they're struggling with, how do you really reconcile the power of these projects with the imperatives of the business? All right, when do you use something like a 10 gen or a Mongo? When do you use something like a Memcache? When do you use a new? Those are some, some serious questions that you want to think through before you start to embark on a real you know, killer big data project. So I talked about um, examples of the Wall Street Company and the example of the travel services, but this specific example, it's a published report, so that's why I thought I'd share it. It's uh, one of Red Hat's customers, it's Intuit, in, uh, on the west coast of the United States. For those of you who are not familiar with Intuit, I believe they're the world's largest personal software company. 
right, personal finance software company, which is help you find your taxes, help you manage your expenses. So they've got a portfolio of solutions targeted at consumers, you know, by April 15, when the federal taxes are due in North America or in the US, everybody goes on to their Intuit website and files their taxes and gets their returns. So there's a tremendous amount of data that Intuit as a company gathers. And the way to think about big data, you know, more than just talking about bits and bytes and analytics and ETL and all this stuff, the CMO worked with the, the chief marketing officer in Intuit, worked with the CIO, and came up with some real simple use cases. Way to be used big data. And they've kind of partitioned into two pieces. One is more inward focus, which is what they call data for decision. I got these customers are using the personal tax software, but they also want personal finance. So they munch through a tremendous amount of data to actually help the internal decision making. But more importantly, what they also talk about is data for delight, which is how they can present the customer's data to themselves, the customers, so that they can really understand what is in it. So when they think, which I thought was a very, very powerful use of how they think about big data, which is an internal focus on our decision making, an external focus on our making sure they can provide meaningful, insightful data to their customers and the customers can find relevance with. The other interesting thing, if you think about big data, in contrast with your traditional DBMS type of you know, application servers, web servers, and other things, is I would argue that there is a little bit of an inversion going on between the application and the data. What I mean by that is on the, let me just make sure I got the right side, on the left side of this uh, slide, it's your traditional large monolithic application that deals with, I don't know, perhaps a few hundred gigabytes of data. Or might be given a benefit of the doubt, it might be a terabyte of data. What big data does is pretty much turns it on its head. You have multiple hundred terabytes or terabytes of data that are being accessed by light applications, either at the mobile, or down on a remote edge device, or just a bunch of applets that go access the data. So the reason, for the reason this becomes really important is the center of gravity is now shifting more towards how do I store secure and scale the data so that these little applications, disparate applications, can access it in a cohesive fashion. So by nature, because of just the sheer volume of data, the underlying storage infrastructure has to be scalable and has to support semi-structured and unstructured data. So when we talk to our customers, and I'm sure you'll share what, uh, some of the sentiment the customers have expressed here. And I don't want to go through each one here, but I want to touch upon a couple of things. One is this notion of storage silos. I don't know about you, but when I talk to not just the business guys, but even the IT guys who are responsible for managing this, they just tear their hair apart, which is how do I just get rid of these silos? They got a bunch of storage infrastructure for files, something else for blocks, something else for some other type of data. And now you're talking about big data. It's like, let's go, build another site. So to the point that uh, the gentleman from Accenture was making, you got to really tear down the walls. I mean, you're now getting into this proverbial guardian not all over again. Which is how do I bunch it all together and make some sense of it? And that's the wrong point. You, know, you have a great opportunity now, since we are pretty much at the you know, baseball parlance at the top of the first inning. The ability to influence what your infrastructure looks like to really manage your big data muscle. Don't go for another side. The other you know, bigger problem is just the unpredictable cost. There's no way you can predict how much storage you're going to need. There's nothing wrong with it because you can always budget for things the right way. But the other problem is, sometimes, it's not just buying more disks. It's everything else that goes with it. I gotta go buy more controllers for these disks. 
you know, the old controllers don't support these new drives. Let me go write another check for $4 million. So it's not so much the cost aspect of it, it's the unpredictability. And because of that, just because of the, you know, the, the basic bureaucratic stuff and getting purchase orders through the system, your project suffers. Your lines of business are screaming at you going, when can I get my data so I can start running these things? So let me just walk through, and I know we have uh, 10 more minutes here, just walk through what I think are, what we believe from Red Hat perspective, and this is what our customers tell us. Half a dozen of some of the you know, impeditors or the basic building blocks that you can think about, whether you're on the IT side, building all this infrastructure, whether you're a developer writing big data applications, some of the things you think about. The first and foremost, and I think Adam talked about it uh, earlier today, which is there is a huge amount of economic, technological, and business advantage to write the volume economics. What I mean by that is there is enough innovation going on with folks like Intel and AMD and such who are packing so much power into x86 servers. But one of the reasons why you see this whole migration from Unix to Linux, as you talked about earlier, is exactly the same thing. People are saying, why am I spending all this money, different management tools, why can't I just write the volume economics of Intel, the classic C86 servers bring to the table? So start here. Don't go with, let me just build up this huge, humongous tower of storage, because you're going to run out of capacity. You absolutely are. Take advantage of volume economics and scale out as you go through. The second thing you need to keep in mind is, and this is even more important as you think of big companies, one size doesn't fit all. What might work with a Hadoop network implementation might not work on a Memcache or Engen or MongoDB type of implementation. So think it through, right? What are the storage implications for the projects, the type of applications you are running? The third, you know, which I think it's uh, very critical, is don't overlook, right, all the basic, what I would call, blocking and tackling that needs to happen on the storage side to make you successful in your big data endeavors. And they just listed out a few here, which is when you're talking about you know, hundreds of gigabytes or petabytes, terabytes or petabytes of storage. Features like snapshot are absolutely critical. You don't need to back up everything, all your 200 gigabytes and petabytes of storage every day. There's the ability for you to take advantage of some of the intrinsic features that are available in some of the storage management software solutions today. Things like high availability, things like data duplication. Those are absolutely transformable and absolutely translatable if you choose the right solutions into your big data environments. The other um, thing which is, you're not seeing that today, but I, I bet you next year at this you know, venue, when we talk about where customers are with big data and where you're using this, you're gonna see more and more of this. What I mean by here, uh, by the slide here is as the virtualization technologies get smarter and you can pack a lot more cores into your servers. You're going to start moving away from a physical type of infrastructure to a virtual, a virtual infrastructure for your big data initiatives. And the other part, is, especially for some of you, might be what I would call in a service provider type of business. Multi tenancy is absolutely critical. Right, so customer A wants to run some data, and they don't want to, you don't want to have them stomping over customer B's, customer B's data. How do you make sure your entire your storage infrastructure really supports the ability to separate out your storage cluster from the compute cluster? And over time, perhaps they can run all together peacefully, but initially, I think it gives you the flexibility and the agility literally to scale out on both fronts. I need more compute power, I just increase my compute power. I need more storage power, I need my storage power. I'm going to increase my storage power. So preserve that degree of flexibility and the degree of freedom that you, gives you the ability to react to your business needs. 
Talking about simplicity, uh, how many of you are familiar with Facebook's open computer platform? Just a curious one person there. Take a look at it. You know, I'm just going to just Google for it. It's actually a pretty brilliant idea. You know, I think Harry and IBM was talking about earlier about collaboration and how do you move the ball forward in terms of innovation. So what Facebook did was they launched this thing called Open Computer Platform. Essentially, it's a blueprint. They are sharing what the data center looks like. Because a few years from now, I predict that every large data center is going to look like what Facebook's data center looks like today. To get ahead of the curve, look at some of the things. And the, the basic theme behind the OCP and Open Computer Platform, which I thought was pretty cool, is simplicity. Truly is a very simple design on building our data centers. It's pretty compelling, right? And the thing which Facebook, as part of this, what they were trying to do was avoid vendor locking. You know, I just want to go to somebody who's got an x86 server who gives me the best price performance choice, take the old one, plug the data center, right? Or my disk, it's hardware, it's going to fail. Let's not build our own disaster recovery or our own availability strategy. Assuming that the disks are going to be available all the time. Let the intelligence move to the software. <laughs> so there's a, 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 a two-hour thing talking about rules of OCPs, but if there's one thing I want to leave out of this, take a look at that. That kind of gives you a sense of where the industry is going, what some of the people are doing today to really tackle some of the big data initiatives. <clears throat> the other part is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, scalability is an absolutely critical theme around big data. And I've just given you a few examples here that you can, if we have customers doing it today, we can tell you that it's better from an economic standpoint, from a, purely from a business availability standpoint. Smaller, smarter servers from huge, humongous scale-up servers, especially when it comes to big data. The seventh thing that, um, you know, this is more of, more of uh, I guess, you know, a provocative way to suggest this, which is today, I would say that when people think about big data, they think of it as rightfully so, I think, for whatever reason, given its legacy from Yahoo and other companies, they've seen some benefits running huge workloads the compute and the storage reside as close to each other as possible. And people have seen tremendous amount of benefits. But as I pointed out earlier, there's a lot more innovation that's going on in the part of big data space. Uh, I saw earlier that either the partner or engine, the MongoDB, there's no sequel. Think about it, there's a lot of other innovations that's going on. So big data is more than just a loop. All right, and underlying storage infrastructure should be, going back to the point, it doesn't come in one size. You've got to have the ability to support different types of data. Structured, unstructured, semi-structured, no SQL, more SQL, you know, whatever these things are. And you're not, I mean, there's no way you can avoid it. There's absolutely no way you can avoid it. So, um, just a couple of uh, plugs on Red Hat's products and what we're doing around this. Um, our whole focus around storage, uh, we launched our storage solutions earlier this year. The whole focus around storage is kind of twofold. One is take advantage of the volume economics. Run, take your x86 server, run our storage software on top, and guess what? Your compute server is now a storage server. It's yeah, complete. So, it's not just from a technology and a business standpoint, but there's numerous advantages to write the volume and standardization work. Because in this world, in the technology world we are in, volumes drive standards and standards drive volumes. That uh, no matter whether it's a Betamax to other comparisons that you make, that's the key, right? So take advantage of that. Because as you take advantage of some of these volume economics, you're gonna to start to evolve towards a very standardized infrastructure. 
I know later on today there is a technical session on Red Hat Story, so I'm not going to bore you with this, but uh, we have a solution today that runs on-prem on a public cloud or a hybrid cloud environment. So, um, and this is my last slide. When we think about big data, right? Think about it in three dimensions. One is make sure it's open. And open it doesn't mean just open it up for security breaches and stuff. Open in the sense the ability to be future proof. Things are gonna change, technology is gonna change. Don't lock yourself in. And I believe that open source is a great way to help you get there. The other is, whether you like it or not, you know, build the hybrid strategy. You're never going to have enough capacity in your data, room, in your data center to deal with the, just the onslaught of data. And the best way to go around a hybrid approach is private cloud and a public cloud and the ability to seamlessly coexist. And I think these are some of the things that our customers are embarking on and I thought I could share this with you. And I'd love to come back here a year from now and see if uh, any of this makes sense to you. Thank you.